Burgess and acquisitions are sure off to a quick start in this new year. Some big headlines in M&A, of course, today. We've got Cadbury finally accepting Kraft's offer for almost $20 billion U.S. dollars. Also, U.S. gas company Williams will be merging two affiliated partnerships and security provider Tyco will be buying Brinks Home Security for the price of $2 billion. Joining us now to talk about all of this is Frank Aquila, a partner at Sullivan and Cromwell. Now, in 2009, his firm was named Corporate M&A Team of the Year for the second year in a row by Legal Reviewers Chambers USA. Welcome to you, Frank. Great to see you, as always. Good to see you, Laurie. All right, let's stop, start with the Kraft Cadbury deal here. After four months, Kraft finally gets Cadbury for the increased price, as we reported, of nearly $20 billion U.S. dollars. So what does it say to you about the climate for deal flow? What does this one in particular say to you about what companies, what shareholders are looking for? Well, I think it says a couple of things. First of all, you can finance the big strategic deals because of the fact if they make industrial logic, companies are going to uh, be able to borrow. The bigger issue, and I think uh, we've seen a bit of this <clears throat> developing over the last couple of years, is blue chip companies utilizing unsolicited bids. Uh, you know, you go back 20 years ago, everybody thought of, you know, corporate raiders as doing unsolicited bids, hostile bids. Today, you're seeing the big blue chip companies doing them and doing them uh, very successfully. And they're not getting such a bad rap for doing it. Is that what you're alluding to? I exactly. I mean, uh, to a certain extent, there's always going to be a negative to an unsolicited bid, but uh, they're becoming much more acceptable. What do you think of the price uh, and the way Kraft is paying for Cadbury? We mentioned almost 20 billion USD. Uh, it breaks down 40 percent stock and 60 percent cash. Is that in the best interest in, you for, in your view for all parties involved? Well, I, I think what, uh, you know, I, not speaking about that in particular, but I think what we're going to see are increased bids where uh, they're using a combination of stock and cash. Uh, more and more companies don't want to over leverage. They don't want to repeat the mistakes of a few years ago. Frank, I was going to yes. say, is that because they, they finally learned the lessons of the past and now it's, it might be better just to split that down the middle or at least as close to 50-50 as you <clears> can get? Well, I think, again, it's going to uh, you know, be a, a, a particular situation by particular situation. If you have a ton of cash on your books, and a lot of U.S. companies uh, have a tremendous amount of cash on their books today. Uh, throughout the financial crisis, as they cut share buybacks, cut uh, employment, cut back costs, they've generated a huge amount of cash. Right. And so a lot of them are going to deploy that in M&A. So if you have a lot of cash and you believe your share price is undervalued, you're going to want to use that cash. And plus, might I ask, too, because I guess given what's been going on over the past year and a half, two years, shareholders won't countenance anything less, will they? That's right. I think uh, shareholders are, you know, clearly have been much more active over the last year or two, really the last uh, decade since uh, the Enron, WorldCom uh, meltdowns and Sarbanes-Oxley. Institutional shareholders have become very vocal about deals and deal terms. No more blind loyalty. No more blind loyalty, that's certainly for sure. I want to talk to you now about the debt picture, which we see with Williams Company. I guess the goal here, they're merging two of its natural gas and energy processing affiliates. The effort is to generate three and a half billion to, to pay down debt. So what does it say to you about companies' priorities in this climate for getting that debt, or if that is a priority off the balance sheet, or is it an industry by industry situation? It, it's really a company by company situation because a lot of companies borrowed significantly either to do acquisitions, sometimes to leverage up their balance sheet for share buybacks or increased dividends. Uh, and what happened is that their leverage went up. Those loans are starting to come due, and no one wants to have to pay off huge amounts of debt in 2011, 12, and 13. So they're starting to uh, deal with that picture. So in this economic client, is it better or worse for a company to have debt on its balance sheet or what percentage of debt? Well, uh, companies are always by and large going to have uh, a certain level of debt and I think that uh, the percentage of debt is going to vary by industry and what their capital needs are going forward but what you want to do is make sure that in no particular year or series of years that you have a significant amount of debt to pay down so what 
uh, Williams appears to be doing is smoothing out its debt, coming up with a better structure so that they are in a better position over the next few years. And as uh, something as, as you write, because I'm, I'm seeing that you mentioned <laughs> that it was a phenomenon for 2009, company after company reporting reduced revenue with profit that meet market expectations. Right. And, and I think what we're seeing, and that's uh, really what we're seeing in the uh, uh, Tyco uh, deal, is companies have cut, they've uh, generated cash, they really can't cut anymore. Where are they going to find growth? They're going to find growth by combining with someone else in the sector. You can cut even further and you get your growth through that acquisition. So if you can't get growth organically from the marketplace, you can get it in organically through an acquisition. So you've written that M&A deals struck during financial downturns yield higher returns than those completed during economic upswings. How so? It, it's sort of basic. Uh, buy low, sell high is the uh -huh. uh, old euphemism. And if you're buying at what appears to be a trough of the market where there's potentially not a huge amount of competition, where people are fairly realistic about uh, the growth possibilities, uh, you're more than likely to get a fairer price. Whereas if you're buying when the market is frothy, uh, you know, a lot of those deals will work out, but some of them won't. Frank, you talked about, uh, just mentioned briefly again, Tyco. Is this a consolidation story? Uh, definitely. I think that uh, uh, Tyco owns ADT. Uh, they uh, won ADT in a, a battle about 10 years ago. Uh, Western Resources had made a hostile bid for ADT, and Tyco came in as the uh, white knight. And, and now what they're doing is they're consolidating one of their key uh, uh, rivals. So what's your advice here as we round out our conversation for trying to figure out where the next big deal will happen? How do you look at a company, its balance sheet, the economic circumstances? I think you want to look at companies that have a lot of cash, companies that have low growth either in their core business or in their home market. And you want to look at companies really around the world. We're going to see more cross-border deals. We're going to see deals in all various sectors. And I think, you know, as we've been talking about over the last few months, uh, I at least think that 2010 could be a very interesting year for M&A. Well, we certainly hope so for your benefit. We'll have you back to uh, talk about this. For the market's benefit, those. not yes. my benefit. <laughs> Frank, always great to see you. Good to see you. Frank O'Quill of Sullivan and Cromwell. Well, just